So let's 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 do a little brief history of reverb. Back in the 1940s and 50s, if you were recording a classic singer, whoever that was, and you wanted reverb on your recording, what did you do? How did you how did you capture reverb? Move the amp, yeah, or move the mic, right? Move the mic further from the guy's mouth or the singer's mouth. And then you captured more of the room and less of the direct signal and you captured some reverb and that was cool. What happens if you had the mic too far from Elvis and Elvis left the building? People got mad at you, right? They're like, you blew it. He was here for one session and you had the mic too far away because you were trying to capture reverb and you ruined this opportunity to record Elvis and everyone's mad at you. So that wasn't fun. So it was scary to capture reverb back in the day because if you did it wrong, it was permanent. Engineers didn't like that. What if you wanted to capture additional reverb from that from the Elvis session aside from moving the mic around in front of his mouth? What did you do? How else would you record reverb? More mics. Yes, Kevin. Yes, Kevin. More mics, right? You would throw some mics in the corner of the room to capture the reverb in the room. And those are room mics, right? And then you could blend those in and you'd have what we call organic reverb, right? Organic reverb. So that was the beginning of playing with reverb in a, on a creative, in a creative fashion. Okay, very nice. Then... Like I said, engineers hated the idea that either they would get it right or they'd blow it. So people went to create artificial reverb. What was the first artificial reverb that was created? Anybody? I think it's a plate. Yeah, I think it was a plate. I think it was Austrian. And, and a plate reverb, you know, is a ginormous scary thing. It looks like this. They're crazy huge. Look, look how big these are. That's a plate reverb. It's bigger than two guys with hats, right? I mean, these, these are heavy. These are hard to pick up. This, this is, these are ginormous things. They're two huge metal plates with a little speaker and uh, a little microphone. And it makes these metallic plates start to vibrate. And the metallic wash is like the sound of reverb. Like it, but it's not the sound of reverb. It's just a cool, interesting sound, but it's not very realistic. But it was a start. And you would put them in a studio, out of the way, down the hall, in a quiet room, so it wouldn't pick up any other vibrations. And you would send a vocal to it, and you'd bring, bring the vocal back. And it would make a nice metallic wash and almost like a beautiful halo effect. And it was cool, but it didn't sound like a real room. And they also made spring reverbs. And those are also cool. And it allowed you to add reverb to Elvis after he left the building. And it was a good thing. It was a step in the right direction for the amount of control that people were looking for. So plates and spring reverbs, what category is that the first is organic room mics is organic what, what are plates and spring reverbs what category of reverb analog that's analog reverb right we've gone from organic reverb to analog reverb and analog reverb was cool and we still love it and we still play with it and some studios still have plate reverbs but we use plates all the time in the box and we love our plates because they're cool you know they have a cool sound to them they don't sound like a real room but they're cool Okay, so then the 80s came along, I guess the late 70s, early 80s, and, uh, and digital was born. And since we said before, and Andrew said it correctly, you know, reverb is a delay-based effect, so why couldn't we take a digital delay and have a whole bunch of different what we call taps, which are just different timings, and then randomize those taps and why couldn't we create a complex digital delay that emulated the sound of reverb? Well, sure we can. And so the digital delay was born and the digital reverb was born. And so we have stuff like the 
Lexicon 300. And these were not cheap, you know, when they first came out. They were expensive and they were fancy and they were really, really cool. And and did this did these sound like a real room? Did these sound like a real room? Mm, pretty good. They sounded good, but they sounded more like an ideal room than a real room. You know, they sounded like an ideal dream room. And that was cool, you know, especially for dreamy pop music, for our science fiction movies, for our perfect churches, our perfect halls. It was perfection. Maybe it was too perfect. Maybe it wasn't realistic enough, but it was cool. And at first they were primitive and then they got better and better and better and better. And they sound really good. What kind of reverb is this called? No, it's not convolution. Not yet. Not in the 80s. Not yet. It's called digital algorithmic. Digital algorithmic reverb. And we still use it just like analog reverb and just like organic reverb. We still use it. We still love it. It's the ideal space more than it is, you know, the real space. But it's very, very useful and it's in our toolbox. 100%. Yeah? Okay. Then some brilliant guys in Amsterdam figured out that you could sample rooms and then you could play that sample back um, with a sampler and you could intertwine the dry signal and the sampled signal and it really sounded like you were in that actual room with all the quirky, weird things that came along with real spaces, right? You, you would, they would go to a space, they'd play a sine wave, whoop, sine wave sweep. They played out with speakers. They record it with a microphone as we can see there. Then they would cancel out the recording and they'd be left with the ambience. They put it in a sampler. And this, all of a sudden, you have the real room. The real room. This was uh, an absolute revolution when they figured out how to do this. What is this called? Yeah, Altiverb's amazing. They used to give us an academic discount. Maybe they will again sometime. Um, it's very expensive, but it's worth it. What is this what is this style of reverb called? Convolution, yes. Convolution. And the different samples are called impulse responses. So now we've gone from having the uh ideal room to having the real room. And now we kind of have everything. We have organic, we have analog, we have digital algorithmic, and we have convolution. Which one is the best? It's not It's not a sports. It's not the, yeah, they all are. Thank you. They're all good. That's the point. That's the point. It's not a competition. Um, they're all good. They're all useful. We use them all in our system. Okay. So let's do a little bit of ear training. And let's just go through some of these reverbs so we get a sense of what a hall sounds like what a chamber sounds like, what a room sounds like, you know, what these different things sound like, some ear training. There's nothing better to learn reverb with than a snare, a single snare hit, because it, 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 it excites the room and then it gets out of the way and you can hear the quality of the reverb better than if I had a guitar loop or something like that, right? You get you get to hear the naked reverb in a in an incredibly helpful way. So we're gonna and we're gonna go here. So we're gonna send, and we'll talk about pre-fader and post-fader sends on Thursday. We're gonna send it to a return track, and on this return track, we're gonna go to Altiverb. And so this is what Altiverb looks like. And if we go here, we see all the different categories 
of reverb here. So we have concert hall, we have religious spaces, uh, we have studio, recording studios, we have opera houses, we have stadiums, mausoleums, clubs, miscellaneous, houses, bathrooms, bedrooms, hallways, cars, trains, outdoor stuff, corridors, public spaces, schools. But we also have gear, right? We also have analog reverbs, plates, spring reverbs. We have digital algorithmic reverbs. You know, so we have the entire world of reverb inside this convolution reverb. Now, what, what industry loves convolution? Not hard to guess. Yeah, film. Exactly, Kevin, film. If they want uh, whoever uh, Tom Cruise running down a hallway, they use a hallway reverb. Then he goes into an elevator, they use an elevator reverb. Then he goes to a rooftop, they use a rooftop reverb. He gets into a helicopter, it's a helicopter reverb. They, didn't, they don't have to sit there tweaking digital algorithmic reverbs being like, does that sound like you're in a helicopter? Right? They just use the actual samples and it's they love this. Right? They love their alter verb. So do music people. Okay, so we'll start here. Let's go to concert halls. And we have all these different concert halls all over the world. And if you click on a concert hall, you, you have mono input and stereo input, um, which will create a different response in the room. So if you had a stereo guitar, you might want to use stereo. If you had a mono element, you might want to use mono. And then you have different distances and different mic patterns, right? I don't know how much people know about microphones, but there's cardioid, which picks up the front of the mic, rejects the back. And there's omni, which makes the mic sensitive in a 360 degree zone, which people say, is the most natural sounding for organic reverb. So you can pick your distance, and this is back to the blind person walking in New York City. You know, they'll know if you pick the distance sample, it's gonna make it seem more far away, the element. And if you pick the closer one, it's gonna make it seem like you're closer to the sound source. So this is you as a movie director, creating the space, the distance, and the ambience um, that you're looking for. So let's just flip around to listen to a couple different concert halls. Do they all sound the same? No. Different different tonality. Some are brighter. Some are bassier. Some have a more pronounced mid-range. Some have a faster decay. Some have a longer decay. And then each frequency zone has its own decay. Some has the low frequencies ring out longer, some shorter. Same with the highs, same with the mids. And if you're, you know, close your eyes, you, you imagine yourself being in different spaces. What's the difference between a concert hall and a room? 
acoustics. One is made for music, right? One one is constructed by architects and building construction experts who know how to make things sound good. That's what they dedicated their lives to. And they usually have high ceilings and they usually have bright reflective surfaces so that the sound ring stays in the room. This, a lot of this stuff was made before there was electricity. There was no amps. There was no microphones. There's no front of house mixer. There are people singing and playing instruments and these people learned how to make shapes and vaulted ceilings and all kinds of things to make it sound good and to have the sound project out to the people listening. It's an art and a science, right? A room, what do you do in a room? Make lunch, iron your clothes, take a nap, watch TV. Rooms are for people to live in. They're not for music. Or do we use a lot of rooms when we're mixing? No. Unless you're trying to make it that the guy played a guitar or the lady played a guitar in your room. But, you know, sure. No, no, no. We love our concert halls when we're mixing. And we love our chambers. They're made for music. Rooms are made for hanging out, you know, and I love rooms. Okay. So that's some concert halls. Now we go to religious spaces and let's just sample a couple of these Okay, do these sound like concert halls? No. These things have crazy long decays. Is that on purpose? Oh, yeah. Why? Why did they do that? Why did, why, why did, why are the acoustics, that, that's on purpose, those high, high ceilings and that, all that stone. So it would become mystical, heavenly. These are religious spaces, powerful, exactly, mystical and powerful. And if you were praying or if you were singing or hymns or whatever, that, this, that the sound would just carry on, fill up the space, even if it maybe wasn't a whole lot of people, you know? <laughs> I bet you one person singing in there would fill up the whole church. This is intentional to be mystical and powerful and moving for religious spaces. Now here, here we're going to go to recording studios. And I think in, these are some of the fanciest, most expensive, fancy recording studios in the world. But people usually are a little bit underwhelmed when I play them these reverbs. Let's go through them first and then let's talk about it.
not 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 nearly as huge as as the religious spaces or as big sounding as the as the uh, concert halls. These are kind of short and tight, but and yet these are like you know lots of money and expertise went into constructing these. Why are they like that? Is that because they don't know how to do it, or that's on purpose? It, it, but that's what it is, Michael. It's supposed to be neat so that you can add more later. Exactly. Exactly. Precisely. So actually, they controlled, and so that you didn't walk away. It's hard to unreverb things, you know? It's, it's not impossible, but it's hard. So they want you to have just a little air on your recordings, but they wanted you to have control so you could add more reverb later. 100%. That's, what these, that's the idea of these recording studios. Okay. So now, you know, we got stadiums. Some crazy, long, weird, flangey things going on there, right? Some crazy modulation. So these are just huge spaces, and this we could use for music, or we could use it for film and post-production. Here's mausoleums, and these are huge, usually stone spaces that are also have usually just a mystical quality to them and some crazy long decays. And then this has some circular design, the Golgumbas, in uh, India, and you get some interesting ambient behavior from this. Right, really big spaces and super long decay times. All right, let's jump around and let's let's go to some gear. And here is a very famous EMT plate where the two guys in the hats were. So that's the sound of plates. You know, there's a big variety of the sound. Sometimes plates sound to me like a little bit like an empty warehouse. <laughs> um, sometimes they sound to me like an empty pool, um, swimming pool that's empty. They have, there's different personalities. They have sort of a two-dimensional quality to them because you don't hear the difference between the early and late reflections. We'll talk more about that this week too. Um and they have a cool density to them without real any real pre-delay. Um, and we use them a lot to keep lead vocals and things sort of in the front of the mix. Um, so, 
So we have those. Now we have digital algorithmic reverbs that are sampled, and these are these ideal reverbs. So again, these reverbs were the reverbs that were created, um, you know, digitally, ag digital algorithmically. So these are digital delays and they can sound very, very real. Sometimes they can sound a little bit fake. Sometimes they can sound a little bit metallic, but, but they can also sound very, very real. And you see that you have your whole palette here. You have your ambience reverbs and your plates and your clubs and different things like that. Um, I don't know if there's an echo rack in here. We'd have to look for that. Um, uh, so, so this this is a little bit of an ear training of you know what do these things sound like and when do I use them and how do I use them and we'll talk more about the implementation on Thursday. But but what I want everyone to be able to do is to get a mental sense of what these different kinds of reverbs are for starters. And when you all are mixing, I want you to ask yourself, where am I? Like, where am I? Am I in a recording studio? And we did it when we listened to the reference tracks way back when, when we started class. Um, am I in a recording studio? Am I in a small club? Am I in a big club? Am I in a concert hall? Am I in a alleyway? You have to be able to answer that question for yourself, you know? Um, and, and then you can start to answer it for the mix. <clears throat> but if you're just, if, if you just think reverb is one thing and we're, we're just uh, throwing reverbs at a, track until something magically happens it that's not a good approach and starting to you know create a three-dimensional sort of picture where the mix has a front a middle and a back because that ultimately is what we're looking for uh and have a wonderful rest of your day cheers to learn more about next level sounds online music production courses please visit nextlevelsound.com